Welcome back to Presume Legal. I am Misha Janice, an attorney licensed in New York and Florida, and we are watching the Karen Reed trial, day four. Let's get into it. So today we started with Katie McLaughlin on the stand. Katie started her direct testimony yesterday, but was unable to finish it before the half day that uh, that completed court yesterday. So her direct examination was finished today. It only lasted just a few minutes at the beginning of the morning. To sum up the direct testimony that Katie McLaughlin provided, Katie was a firefighter paramedic with the city of Canton. She was dispatched to the scene in the early morning hours of January 29th. And her role specifically was to assist so she would assist with patient care or assist with speaking with bystanders to bystanders to information to assist in the patient care. Getting to her critical direct testimony, McLaughlin was tasked with the job of speaking with the defendant, Karen Reed. Remember, if you'll recall, firefighter Flametti had started speaking with Karen Reed and he testified that he couldn't get any straight answers from, from the defendant. So instead of trying to uh, continue to ask those investig investigatory questions of the defendant, he just told Katie McLaughlin to follow up with her, try and find out who is the patient, how is he here, what is his name? What is his date of birth? Does he have any allergies or um, is he on any medications? Those kind of questions. So because Karen Reed was the person who looked the most distraught, she looked the most um, impacted by the situation, she was the person that they looked to to try and get some answers about John O'Keefe, who was laying on the ground. Katie McLaughlin testified that Karen was panicked. She was distraught. She was pacing back and forth. So she started questioning Karen Reed as Karen Reed was, you know, pacing here from one place to another. So Katie McLaughlin was kind of following her around, trying to get information that they needed to get to assist in patient care. There came a point where Karen Reed stood still. And as she stood still, she was with the other identified woman on the scene. So Karen Reed is finally still and standing. And Katie McLaughlin is standing next to her. The woman is on the other side. And there is a Canton officer kind of diagonally across from where Katie McLaughlin is. The witness asked if there had been any significant trauma to the patient, and she testified that Karen Reed said, I hit him, to which the other lady who was standing there in that foursome told Karen Reed, you're hysterical, you need to calm down, but Karen Reed repeated it. She said, I hit him. The police officer heard Karen Reed say it and asked her to repeat herself. He said, what did you say? And for the third time, at in that moment, Karen Reed stated again, I hit him. At that point, the witness said that the cop signaled to somebody else to go get Goody, who was the sergeant on the scene. At that point, based on the defendant's demeanor, the witness concluded that it wouldn't be productive to continue to continue questioning her. Um, and additionally, the witness had to drive the ambulance to the hospital at that point in time. She stated that after that exchange, she went to, she stated on direct that after that exchange, she went to the back of the ambulance where John was being treated inside the ambulance. She told from Eddie and she told the paramedics who were inside the back of the ambulance, what Karen Reed had said, but she herself did not assist in any patient care. To summarize, this witness was questioning Karen Reed 
Karen Reed stated, I hit him. The police officer overheard Karen Reed say that and asked her to repeat herself. The defendant repeated herself. The witness left and went to the ambulance and advised the paramedics in the ambulance who were treating John that the defendant had said she hit him. That was the end of the direct testimony. So today we started with the cross-examination. We got some spice today. We got spice. We got fire. We got caliente. We got sass. This was a day to watch if you were watching any day because the defense counsel came out with a bang. They were intent on impeaching this witness about her relationship with an individual whose family lived at 34 Fairview. We started out the cross-examination with counsel trying to clarify whether the witness told Proctor, and we haven't heard from Proctor yet, but from the opening statements, we know that Proctor is the lead state detective. He's the lead state investigator that was assigned to this case, but he also has some questionable relationships. So that's an entirely different issue. But we know that he was doing interviews after the events of that evening. So one of the people that he spoke with was this witness, Katie McLaughlin, who is currently on the stand being cross-examined. In a report to Proctor, the witness stated that Karen Reed turned to her friend and said, I hit him, I hit him four times, she stated that. After which she went to the ambulance, opened the door and told the paramedics inside what Karen Reed had said. She also told them the information that she was able to collect from Karen Reed, which was the name of the individual, the name of the patient and his date of birth. So defense counsel argued that the witness's story evolved from what she told Proctor, which was the day after the events, to what she testified on direct examination. So we're trying to get some impeachment of the witness in different storylines, in her having given different storylines. Next is where the big fireworks came out. Defense counsel said, who is Caitlin Albert? This is out of the blue, without any background information, no foundation. So you kind of had to put it together and recognize the last name Albert. We know that the owners of the home last name is Albert. So maybe this is somebody who's related to the owners of the home. But we're just left to, you know, kind of piece it together. So defense counsel came out, said, who was Caitlin Albert? The witness said, I think it was, I went to school with somebody with that name. The way she testified made it appear as if there was definitely an arm's length. Like, yeah, I've heard that name before. Maybe I recognize her, but we weren't friends. Defense counsel drilled into this. Are you friends? How do you know her? How close are you? The witness maintained that she and Caitlin Albert are acquaintances. They have no mutual friends. They have no one-on-one friendship. But yes, they do know each other. She does know Caitlin Albert. And that's the extent of their relationship. Fence counsel asked, who's her dad? Who is Caitlin Albert's dad? There was an objection that was sustained. Fence counsel asked, do you know her, uh, Caitlin Albert's family? There was another objection. It was sustained. Fence then asked to approach to speak with the judge. All of a sudden, there was a break. The jury was sent out. The witness was sent out. The judge stepped off the bench. She told the defense counsel, show the Commonwealth what you have to show them, and then let the bailiff know to let me know when I should come back in. So you're left just thinking, like, what is going on? All of a sudden, there's no explanation, just like everything is shut down for a few minutes. So they come back. The judge comes back after a couple minutes. 
And turns out we're going to do a voir dire. There are going to be questions asked of the witness, Katie McLaughlin, who's still on the who's still uh, on the witness stand. She's brought back in. Questions are going to be asked of her without the jury present, assumedly about this person, Caitlin Albert. So that's where we start here. So defense counsel asks the witness, hey, we just sent you out. Has anybody from the Commonwealth spoken to you in these past few minutes? Witness says, no, they've only asked me, you know, if I needed some water or needed to use the restroom. But there were no substantive conversations. We get the we get questions again, trying to cement the defense counsel, trying to cement the witness's testimony about her level of relationship with this person named Caitlin Albert. Again, the witness testifies that they are acquaintances. She doesn't consider her a friend, only an acquaintance. They do have mutual friends. She's known her since high school, which was about 10 years. The witness testified that she doesn't know Caitlin's family and she doesn't recall, not has never, but she doesn't recall ever being at Caitlin's house. She has no recollection of ever being at her house, which we all know by now that means, so there's a possibility that you have been to the house because you didn't answer definitively, no, I have never been to this person's house. She simply doesn't remember if she's been to her house. The witness testified that, yes, she is social media friends with Caitlin Albert. At this point, the defense counsel introduces or brings up a document for the witness to look at. The witness says it looks like some sort of social media printout. Apparently it is because uh, she testifies that under Caitlin's list of friends, the witness's social media handle appears. So Katie McLaughlin is a friend, is a listed friend on social media of this person, Caitlin Albert. Defense counsel brings up another document. This is a photograph. In the photograph is both the witness and Caitlin, but the witness doesn't remember where the picture was taken, when it was taken, what event it was taken at. Um, apparently it was taken at a beach, but she didn't know what beach was being shown. There were multiple people in the picture and the witness recognized the people in the picture. But again, she didn't know when the picture was taken. And she stated that the picture looked old to her. Defense counsel got her to admit that it was probably a trip out of this small city of Canton. So it was a day trip and it was a trip made with multiple people, with friends, everybody going to the same location. So not only had she spent a day with this person in a friend group, but they post for pictures together. In a third document, it's another picture uh, depicting both the witness and Caitlin Albert. Again, witness denies knowing anything about the picture, where it was taken, who took it, where it came from. Um, but defense counsel establishes that, yes, it was another socializing occasion with Caitlin. The fourth picture that defense counsel showed the witness was yet another picture of them. And these all appear to be different, different instances. They're wearing different outfits. I guess there were multiple beach pictures because they're wearing, you know, different swimsuits. But in this fourth picture, the witness is kneeling down next to Caitlin. The witness is behind Caitlin with her right arm around Caitlin. Caitlin's drinking a beer. They're both wearing swimsuits. The witness agrees that the picture was maybe posted on social media, but is unsure where the picture was taken. But none of the pictures that defense counsel showed her remind the witness whether the witness had ever been over to Caitlin's house or vice versa. 
Last time that the witness spoke to Caitlin was, quote, probably a few years ago. And she doesn't remember the last time that they were at the same event, same, you know, socializing. The witness testified that when she got to the house on Fairview on in the early morning hours of January 29th, she says that she didn't know that Caitlin's family lived there. And it was sometime after she learned who owned the house. She stated finally that she didn't know Caitlin's siblings. She doesn't remember having met any of them. So the Commonwealth came up after that to try and clarify some things. They clarified and reiterated that the witness is just an acquaintance with Caitlin Albert, that the witness doesn't know when the pictures shown were taken, that she and Caitlin Albert never had a, you know, any kind of close one-on-one relationship. They never hung out together unless it was with a large group of mutual friends. The Commonwealth also established that Witness has a lot of social media, quote unquote, friends, but in real life, she has, you know, a very small amount of people that she considers real friends. Basically establishing that So just because she and Caitlin Albert are social media friends, that doesn't make them close buddies in real life outside of the social media realm. So after the presentation, after wadiering of Katie McLaughlin, McLaughlin with those four documents, the judge let us know that there was a violation of Rule 14 regarding the admission of those documents. And the judge ruled that those exhibits will not come in based on the voir dire testimony that they just had. She wasn't going to allow the actual pictures to be shown to the jury because of the Rule 14 violation. However, defense counsel would be able to ask the witness about the relationship that she had with Caitlin Albert their socialization, the the friends that they are on social media, those types of questions, but not about the specific pictures. So the jury came back inside and we'll actually hear a little bit more about that rule 14 violation at the end of today's session in court, because it does come up again. So after that ruling, the jury came back inside and the defense counsel and Commonwealth examined the witness again on the same topics that they asked in the voir dire, except for the introduction of those pictures. So the jury never got to see the pictures, but they did get to hear about the witness's relationship with Caitlin Albert, that they, uh, that they had known each other since high school, that they traveled together with mutual friends, they had taken day trips together, that the witness has seen at least three pictures of the two of them at events together. So the jury knows that there are pictures that exist, but the jury's not going to see those pictures. But the jury did hear about them being social media friends. And in front of the jury, defense counsel also established the slightly different story that the witness gave in a statement to Proctor the day after the incident versus the testimony that the witness provided on direct examination, namely that it wasn't exactly the same. There were some objections here, some sidebars, and some sustained objections when the defense counsel asked the witness if she knows who Kevin Albert is, what he does, whether he was the individual who scheduled her to speak with Proctor on the 30th. On her redirect, the witness explained that. Again, the relationship she had with Caitlin Albert was more of an acquaintance, not so much uh, 
a close friendship. Although she has a lot of social media friends, she has very few real friends in real life. And, you know, obviously, Caitlin Albert is not one of those real one on one friendships that she has in real life. They mentioned the pictures, and the witness let the jury know that she doesn't know when the pictures were taken and that the pictures depict trips that were always with groups of friends, like big friend groups. The witness stated that she's a civil servant in Canton. And when a call comes in, she's dispatched to the call, regardless of if she knows who the call is about, or if she knows the location that she's going to. She doesn't have a choice. She can't decline to go to a call just because she might know somebody who was involved with the call. It was at this time that the witness was dismissed and the judge stood up and said, it's time for the view. The view, she said, the purpose of which is to better understand the evidence and appreciate the location and the surroundings that are at issue in the case. This is really a field trip. Everybody's going to get in a bus and the lawyers, the jury, the judge, they'll all ride over to 34 Fairview and look at the road, look at the house, look at the, the yard, see where everything happened. The lawyers will be able to point things out, but they will otherwise not speak to the jury. The jury is also not allowed to take notes or pictures or do any kind of in independent investigation once they're out on the field trip. So before they left for the field trip, the Commonwealth and the defense, they both had an opportunity to give a short opening. They called it an opening, a view opening, during which they each spoke directly to the jury and told them the things that they would like the jury to take note of during the field trip. I keep calling it a field trip because I feel like field trip days were always the best days in school. So the Commonwealth told the jury to take note of the street names, the roadway, the abutments, the neighboring homes, the driveway, the items on the front lawn, the lanes that separate the, the road. And apparently they're going to see a vehicle as well. And I'm thinking this is maybe Karen Reed's vehicle, but it was not specified. That's the assumption that I came to. So the Commonwealth wanted them to take note of the vehicle, the size of it, the exterior, the interior. And he said, take a note of the center console of that vehicle. This was only a minute, maybe, maybe two minutes. Thankfully, they kept it short. The defense then next gave their opening. They wanted the jury to take note of the relationship of the physical things on the scene. So, you know, the distance between the fire hydrant and the flagpole and the house, et cetera. That's what they uh, asked the jury to focus on. And if there's a question about whether Karen Reed is going to the viewing, she is not. She does not get to go on the field trip with everybody else. So at that point, the jury was dismissed and the camera panned up to the ceiling fan, the one lone ceiling fan in the courtroom. And we thought it was it, done for the day. And then all of a sudden, it panned back down. And we saw them speaking. And it was like, wait, what's going on? At when I saw it, I thought that, you know, something had just rewound and they were replaying the last few minutes or something. But no, I kept watching and there was more substantive stuff to happen. So the defense counsel asked the judge if they could put additional information on the record. And this related to the denial of their denial of entry of the evidence, those four pictures, the four exhibits that were deemed inadmissible by the judge. The defense counsel wanted to make their argument. They wanted to put it on the record. It was proper. The jury was not in there anymore. 
So I'm glad that we were able to hear this because it seemed like the judge calls them up very, very often to sidebar so that we're not hearing um, any of the discussion. We're not hearing anything of what's going on. And I don't know if that's been something that's been going on in this case. I know that this case has been going on a very long time and that there have been hearings in the past. I'm not sure about what because I never watched any of those or heard anything about them. But we did get to see this argument get put on the record. Let me tell you about it real quick. So the defense counsel was saying under Rule 14, they did not have any obligation to disclose the exhibits to the Commonwealth in discovery. The Commonwealth raised the objection that the pictures, those exhibits, should not be introduced as evidence because they were seeing it for the first time that day. Now, if you'll recall, these were pictures printed out from social media. So if the defense counsel could access those photos, then why couldn't the Commonwealth? Rule 14 does not require, Rule 14, defense counsel argued, does not require disclosure if the evidence that's not being shared will be used for impeachment purposes only. So impeachment is when the witness says something and you get to call them on it based on some other evidence that contradicts what they just said. That's impeachment in a nutshell, right? So defense counsel argued, had the witness admitted the extent of her relationship with Caitlin Albert up front, defense wouldn't need to have impeached her. The witness said when initially asked the question, do you know Caitlin Albert? The witness said, I went to high school with some person named Caitlin Albert. Defense call that a bastardization of the truth. Wow. Shots. So the four pictures are what actually got the witness to admit that she does know Caitlin Albert. She's not just some person that she knew her name in high school. No. And they knew each other on a very different level than what the witness initially expressed to the jury. So defense counsel argued that they were entitled to show the witness's probable bias or probable prejudice because of the witness's prior existing relationship with Caitlin Albert about which the witness was not truthful. I think this is a strong argument to, and I think this is an argument that is possibly appealable, or rather the, the ruling is possibly appealable. The defense counsel did request the judge to reconsider entry of the pictures, especially since the jury just heard about the existence of pictures. So now the jury's probably wondering like, oh, what are these pictures? Can we see what they are? I would want to see what they are. Well, the judge denied that request quick, quick. Like she wasted no time. She was like, nope, let's, let's keep it moving. So the defense counsel made their record. The record is clear now about what the position was, whether they're the argument of uh, whether there was a violation of Rule 14, and whether those exhibits should have come in. Now, even if they were able to come in because of no violation of Rule 14, there's a question as to whether they would have been able to come in based on foundation. There was no foundation given for those pictures. We don't know who took the pictures. We don't know where the pictures came from. We don't know when the pictures were posted. These pictures could be AI. The witness never said that they were pictures that were posted from her social media account. And defense counsel never said that these pictures were subpoenaed from somebody else. Now, they could come in sometime later. Maybe if Caitlin Albert comes in to testify, I can't remember from the Commonwealth's list of witnesses if Caitlin Albert was one of those that were mentioned. But if Caitlin Albert comes in to, to testify, the pictures could possibly come in because she can provide a foundation for having, having posted the pictures on her own social media. 
So time will tell what happens with that. But this entire exchange today with the voir dire of the of the witness and, you know, the judge denying it, denying entry of the exhibits, not once, but twice. And, you know, the, the jury being dismissed, we thinking that the, the day is done and then all of a sudden we're back on the record. Wow. What a roller coaster today was. The roller coaster was not over quite yet because after the field trip, everyone came back to the courthouse to hear more testimony. We got three more witnesses that testified. All three were firefighter paramedics who were dispatched to the scene that night. First up was Greg Woodbury, who assisted with John's patient care, but he didn't go in the ambulance to the hospital. He ended up returning to the fire station, but was called back out to 34 Fairview for a second time that night, this time for a Section 12. So a Section 12 is a report of an individual having some sort of psychological issue, like making threats of harm to themselves or to others. Back at the scene, he came to learn that the defendant had the Section 12 called on her because of certain statements she had made. We come to learn through the next witness, Dan Whitley, that the defendant was saying stuff like, quote, I don't want to live anymore if my husband dies, close quote. That witness testified that he didn't think the defendant's statements rose to the level of a Section 12 because it seemed like she was just speaking out of the normal grieving process. The third witness, Jason Becker, testified that the 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 defendant told him she made the self-harm statements due to the trauma she was going through, and she didn't intend on acting on it. Nevertheless, once a Section 12 is initiated, it's mandatory for the individual to be taken to the hospital for an assessment. So the defendant was resistant, but eventually she got into the ambulance and was described by those three witnesses as very upset, distraught, repeatedly asking if her, quote, husband could survive being out in the cold like John had been if he was dead and questioning whether she could care for the kids by herself. The defendant told the paramedics that she and her husband had had an argument that night, but she didn't provide any details and she didn't specify how the argument was communicated, whether it was in person or text message or voicemails or some other way. So the paramedics had taken the defendant's vitals and they were more mostly normal. The defendant had also denied having taken drugs or alcohol during that evaluation. In the cross-examination of these three witnesses, we learned a few things. We learned that the defendant's medical history included a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, MS, which is a progressive neurological disease. The defense also introduced into evidence a photograph of John's right arm showing the lacerations that uh, that were on that arm. And finally, on cross, the defense called into question paramedic Becker's seemingly contradictory statement about what the defendant said about having had alcohol. In all reports, the witness said that the defendant told him she had not had alcohol, but Proctor's report says that the defendant told the witness that she did have alcohol that night. And with yet another Proctor report inconsistency, we ended trial day four. So that's a wrap for this week one of the Karen retrial. I hope you'll join me next week for continuing recaps of the testimony. Have a fantastic weekend, my friends. Until the next drop, peace.